Watch your Predates and welcome back to another video. So, in this video, it's part two of how to make a perch bobber float. I hope you really enjoyed per, uh, part one. So, what I'm going to do with part one is I'm going to stick it in the top right hand corner for you to watch. It's a fairly long video, it's about an hour long. Uh, you can skip to the parts you want to, but it's basically how to show you how to build a basic perch float. Um, so, it's the first half. So, really, basically, what we did is uh, this is what we created. This is our perch bob. Uh, it's very very simple very very basic um, it's hard for those that you for, for those of you that haven't seen it it's a hard uh, wooden beach uh, stem all the way through it's not two parts it's one piece and then you've got uh, a cork body now what you saw in part one is you actually saw at the bottom of the shoulder was very torn up which was my fault basically I was a little bit too heavy-handed uh, at pushing the dowel through Normally what I would do is I'd make a point on the end before pushing the, pushing the dowel through in order for it to, to get a, you know, a nice clean finish inside the body. But what I did is I pushed it too hard and I broke up all the bottom. So I took the liberty, as I said in, in part one, is I took the liberty to actually uh, turn this down a little bit more after the video. So I've made the, the float a little bit smaller than what originally the size was. Now... This is still a fairly large float. It's actually, I'd say, a medium size. It's perfect for lobworms, uh, a small live bait. I don't know if you'd fish maggots with it. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too too big for maggots, but certainly lobworms and bunches of worms and small worms would be okay, I reckon. Probably carries around, I would say, five to six AA, maybe a little bit more. But again, it's perfect for, for river situations, in weir pools, that kind of thing. So in this video, you know, up on the last video, you saw, you know, the basic perch build. But in this video, what we're going to do is the fun part. It's actually bringing it to life. We're going to sand it, seal it. So it's all, I mean, it's already sanded already, but we're going to seal it, sand it, seal it. So we'll do it probably two to three times. And what that'll do is it'll stop any um, lacquers that we put on top actually penetrating into the wood and taking longer drying times um, even over a coat of paint it would still do that but what we'll do with this is um, we'll seal it and then what you'll do is or what we all do or you do when you're making yours um, we'll then decorate it to how you want it to be so painting it is very straightforward and very simple I'll talk you through the paints I like to use um, after we've done some painting we can dress it with some threading and whipping that will make the float a little bit stronger even though it's, it's not flimsy or anything at all as it is but what I like about threading it gives it a nice uh, traditional look to it although you can use some more modern colors you know bright colors like yellows and stuff don't see many people whipping with yellows and that they tend to paint with yellow but I don't tend to whip with yellow uh, you've got gold, you've got so many different threads, but we'll go through the thread situation and all the different threads we've got. Um, I'll also whip an eye on the bottom of this one. Now, as I alluded to in the last video, sometimes I like to have an eye, sometimes I don't. Originally and personally, I actually prefer it without an eye um, because I like to use float rubbers. One at the top of the base, one just underneath the shoulder and then one at the bottom. Um, float rubber wise and then I can move it up and down the line as I need to depending on the depth of water I'm fishing because uh, I tend to use these more on rivers you can use them on you know lakes and that as well there's no reason why you can't um, but some people like to have an eye fitted on the bottom it's very traditional and also you can fish it sort of waggler style so you know if you're fishing on a lake or a reservoir or you know any any type of still water it'd be perfect for that as well um, even in the slacks of a river but it's, the, you know, it's all relevant to how you want it to be. I'm just showing you the basic build. How you make it is your own. So, yeah, once we finish decorating it and sealing it and everything, the last thing to do really then is if you want to put a little signature on there, if you want to put a badge on there, um, probably I'll show you maybe how to do the, uh, the badges. Uh, I use decal paper. Again, we'll, we'll go through all that. And then the last thing, the last process is just putting the, the, the lacquer or the varnish on top and letting it dry. Now, I'm not saying you just use one coat. Depending on the different lacquers, could take several coats. I'll talk you through the lacquers I like to use, um, some more expensive than, than others. And um, and then once you've got the hardening time of it actually fully curing, um, then the, the float is finished. Now, I'm going to try and keep it as simple and as short as I can. But again, these are long processes, which may take me 
uh, a few times to explain to you um, so again it could be another long video but if you guys want me to show you from start to finish how to do it unfortunately the videos are going to run a little bit longer so anyway let's get on with it let's put this down we'll talk about sealing it and then we'll go on to painting it okay folks so next part so the first stage we're going to do on part two of the video it's um, we're going to actually seal the float uh, alluded to it earlier on uh, using a sander sealer so um, what it'll do is it'll give it a coating uh, it'll soak into the wood uh, we'll sand it we'll do it a couple of times I'm not going to do it a couple of times in the video but we'll do it a couple of times maybe two to three times um, and basically what it'll do is it'll soak into the into the wood so when you put paint on top dyes um, and uh, the lacquering the varnishing depending on what varnish you use it won't soak into the wood and the drying time will be a lot shorter also by putting a sander sealer on when you sat you, you you know you put your your, your sander sealer on and you you um, sand over the top of it very very light sandpaper or wire wall which i'll show you in a moment it'll bring it brings it up nice and smooth so when you paint over the top and it gives it a nice finish basically and it's not all rough although i've sanded it obviously while i was making it um, you can still feel and see i don't know if you can see on the video I'm uh, not sure if that picks up very closely, but you can still see these little scuff marks and stuff like that. So that that will just basically cover that over and eradicate it. So what do I use? Now there's various different uh, types of sanding sealer on the market. If you go onto eBay, as I keep alluding to, that's where I get most of my stuff. Just because it's for my ease really to, to buy stuff from eBay and get in it um, delivered to my door. Um, with my parents and my brother being here being able to take deliveries it's, it's, I don't get too much time where I can pop to the local hobby craft or the local B&Q home base those kind of places where you can buy bits and pieces like this um, so I mean you can pop to wherever you want to go to but it's just convenience wise I like to um, I like to just order mine off of eBay and Amazon and other different places on, on the web so let's just pop that to one side um, this is the one I use. This is the Brewax or Birawax, Birawax um, sanding sealer. As I say, there's so many on the market. It's irrelevant as to the um, as to the brands. This is a shellac sanding sealer. Um, smells really, really strange. This one I've had for a little while. It's like the consistency of sort of honey, honeydew. Smells really strange. Um, really quite potent stuff. So. Again, you can wear a mask if you want to, or just make sure you're in a well-ventilated room. Uh, I've already shaken it up. What I will say is, when you before you start using this stuff, just give it a little shake up. Don't shake it too much, because you'll create too many air bubbles in it, uh, and you don't really want that. Now, some people keep these in jars and containers and those kind of places. Um, I leave them in this, and when... I, I come to make my floats I use these little cups you probably see these and you'll see these in the video a little bit later on when I make my um, my clear coat you'll see it like I say in future in this future video um, these are little shot cups you can buy these on eBay again these go up to 30 mil uh, little cough medicine cups shot cups shot glasses you can buy like a hundred for like 150 like ridiculous money so I like to buy in bulk I've got quite a few um, just here as you can see <laughs> I like to keep in a little container and they just last me for quite a while a couple of months at least so I like to just pour a little drop in there's quite a few bubbles in it just pour a tiny tiny drop in or enough that I think I'm gonna need get the lid on always get your lid on your uh, paints and stuff like that. you don't want them drying out but like I say if that's the one you want to use that's what I use okay pop that to one side and as you can see, if I hold it up, it's like a honey colour, honey consistency. Loads of bubbles in that, so hopefully they'll come out as I start painting. Uh, when I say painting, uh, a lot of people like to use various different ways. They, they'll dip their floats in it, they can get a cloth and put you know cloth over the top of it. But I like to use a paintbrush. Now, with paintbrushes, you'll see a little bit later on what I use. And I did get a, a few tips, as I say, from other float makers. But I have decent paint brushes, ones that uh, I really look after, ones that cost a little bit of money that I like to use for my painting. And I'll buy really, really cheap ones, like this one here. Again, off eBay, I think I bought like 12 for £152. Something silly like that. Um, these are really, really cheap. Um, 
what I've done is I've cut the bristles down because the bristles are too long. Uh, and what I do is I rough it up because they come, they're really stiff when they come. So I rough it up, pull off any loose hairs. Um, and I like to brush mine on personally. That's how I like to do it. Um, and because they're really cheap, again, I use these for epoxy and clear coating and other other things other than, you know, painting and using the sander seeder. So it's got many different, uh, it's got many different, what's the word, jobs. <laughs> right, so there's no right or wrong way of doing this. Just load it on, really. So get your old paintbrush in now. Not too much, but... Just load it on. It's not hard. It's not a hard job. What it'll do is it'll soak into the wood. Like I say, it's got a funny smell. So you can wear latex gloves if you want to. That's it. That's the shaft done down the bottom. Start putting it on the old cork. And you will see a difference. I mean, the shade that you see here, you can see it's darkening off a little bit now. If you can see that. Let's just pop that down a moment. I'm in the middle of making a, another perch bob. If you look at this one, you can see that's a finished one in terms of the, the sander sealer on the cork. You can see it makes it a, a lot darker. Um, I haven't sander sealed the, um, the shaft yet, um, but when you do that, it actually goes a lot darker. So it really brings up the nice natural dark color of the, um, of the grain of the wood. Not that you see any grain, but it just brings up a dark color. So yeah, just load that on now, and it will all soak in. It's got a strange sort of honey consistency, really light honey consistency. Just grab by the bottom, and then do the top. You know, this is, like I say, it's not rocket science, you can do this. Like I say, you can dip it if you want to, you can use a cloth, whatever. Um, so that's one float completed a two second job as you can see I like to do quite a few at one go so just put that to the side what I do like to dry my floats in as well as obviously hanging them and on the drying rack is this thing here as you can see this is a, a foam block you can again you can buy it on eBay I think these are yoga foam, foam blocks I use them for yoga um, I'm not into yoga <laughs> as you can tell by my shape but um, yes this is um, a foam block that I like to uh, just poke a couple of holes in. You know, you can use a paintbrush, make a hole, cut the holes in it. Other float makers do exactly the same thing. Um, I got this idea from Mr. Gaz uh, Graham Pinkerton. I think it's a really good idea, but most float makers do it. I'm sure, it's probably been around for a while. Again, you could dry them any way you want to. This is where I like to dry mine. These foam, these foam pads come in really handy. I will show you a little bit later on again what Gaz does. I'm going to put a link to um, Graham's Graham Pinkerton's uh, YouTube channel in the top right hand corner for you guys because a lot of what he does I do as well and I learnt from him so I'm not going to sit here and say I'm the first person to come out with these ideas I didn't um, I would say Graham was one of the first to come out with the ideas um, if not him someone before him but I certainly learnt from him and learnt from one of the best so what he does doesn't, isn't far short from wrong so as far as I'm concerned but anyway I'll let that dry once that's fully dried doesn't take long maybe 20 minutes half an hour once it's fully dried in soaked in then what I do so I'll just put this to one side just for the moment I talked about sandpaper you can get 320 grit so it's a very very light sandpaper which isn't got very much um, uh, sand on it at all really you don't want a really heavy uh, sandpaper to start really you know chunking away at the uh, float you want something very very light so 320 grit sandpaper uh, if not I use double grade wire wall you, again you can buy this on eBay or any hardware store all these stuff you could it's easily readily available um, and this stuff what you do is it'll just sand down the uh, the float with the, the sealer on top and I'll probably like I say seal it maybe two or three times um, with a quick rub down with this in between and it'll bring it up nice and uh, nice and clear and nice and smooth ready for, for painting and if I was probably going to end up putting dye on there then I probably wouldn't put sander sealer on it because obviously dye soaks into the wood and that's what I want to create I want to be able to put the, put the dye onto the wood and let it soak in uh, and probably give it a couple of coats of dye but because I'm not using dye and I'm only using paint, there's no point. Now, we'll talk about painting later, but I like to leave as much as the cork as possible. 
free because I think the cork is a lot more beautiful. Um, it shows what the actual material is. Uh, it's very traditional looking. You know, if it's bolster, I don't mind painting over the top of that. I know you can make bolster look quite nice. Uh, in terms of the body I'm talking about now, you can actually um, you can paint uh, the bolster completely or you can put dye on the bolster or even leave bolster clear. Um, and bolster can look quite nice, but I, I just don't think you can beat having... Um, having cork as a body for float, especially perch bobs, just looks so traditional. So we're gonna let that uh, we're gonna let that settle, like I say, give them a couple of uh, rub downs in between, and then we'll move on to the next stage, which will be the painting, or possibly attaching the eye, depending. I mean, there's no real right way uh, of when you actually put things on before the other. So what we'll probably end up doing is painting it first and then attaching the eye. Okay, so I'll see you for the next part of the video in a moment. Okay, so I thought uh, after we've uh, just primed the float that I would show you some of the colours. Now, and some of the paint brands and stuff, I mean, it's not really relevant, but I thought I'd just have a really, really quick brief talk through uh, about what I have and what I use. And, you know, there's many paints out there on the market that I, um, I want to invest in and give a go. So let me just show you what I use. So you've got this stuff here, which is the System Free. Um, this is acrylic. I only use acrylic paints. I don't tend to use any other type of paint apart from acrylic. It's water-based, very low odour, if any odour at all. Um, this is a, this particular one I used years ago when I was at school, believe it or not. Uh, it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, it's like poster paint, basically. Um, it's, it's nice stuff. The only problem is you do need to fill it out. It's really quite thick, but it's got beautiful, beautiful pigment. You know, you've got lovely reds, you've got lovely greens, emerald green uh, and beautiful yellow. So these three colours are really, really nice. I do plan on buying some more blues and other colours as well and blacks and stuff. Um, I really do like this stuff and I really do rate it. The one thing I have a problem with is green. Trying to find a decent green that goes on smoothly is very, very difficult for me at the moment. I'm sure there are people out there that actually, you know, find perfectly adequate green um, when you're painting so at the moment we're just talking about painting with painting brush we're not talking about airbrushing we'll come to that in a moment so when you're painting by hand using brushes like i say green is one of those pigments i've had trouble with trying to find a decent one to use so this one's not too bad again it doesn't go on perfectly so i have to thin it out with, with a tiny little bit of uh, water and what it does is it, it just loosens it up a little bit Okay, so again, it's all water-based acrylics. Um, you've got this particular one as well, this particular rand, which is uh, Windsor & Newton. I tend to use a lot of Windsor & Newton uh, paintbrushes. Uh, again, we'll have a little look at those later when we actually do some painting. Um, I bought these particular two colours of this range. Again, it's quite thick. It needs to be thinned out. Um, this green gold is beautiful. It's very different to any other type of green gold that I've ever seen before. I kind of like the olive greeny, browny colour, and it's absolutely beautiful. And this pink I bought for doing tops with. Again, I've tried this before, and it comes out very thick and blotchy. So you have to give a nice number of even coats, as many as you can, to get it nice and even. So what I mean by that is you do have to play around with your paints. Uh, these are quite expensive, these particular ones, for, for the amount you get. Most uh, paints, I mean, these are 60 mil if you look there. Uh, these ones here, I think they're around 10 pounds, 10, 12 pounds for a big tub like that. But I think I'll pick these up for about six quid each. Um, I'm not quite sure how much is in these ones. Uh, there we go, 250 mil. So there's quite a lot of paint in there. It lasts you pretty much a good couple of years, depending on how many floats you're making, you know. The ones that were shown to me first of all, and I, again, these ones here are what I used when I very first started actually model building years ago. Now you used to get those little plastic kits where you you make like um, uh, you make aircrafts and battleships and tanks and things like that. This uh, this paint is what I use now. As I said, I like to use uh, acrylics. I don't like oil-based paints. A lot of people like oil-based paints, and um, there is benefits to both oil base and acrylics and you also got your downsides to it so you've got your pros and your cons um oils take a lot longer to dry there's a lot of smell that comes with them uh, whereas water-based ones like these particular aqua color revels they dry very very quickly they do blob up quite a lot inside and the consistency is 
I wouldn't say uh, consistent. You know, inside there, you know, some are very runny, some are quite blotchy. But if you get little ball bearings, so little stainless steel ball bearings, again, you can buy on eBay really, really cheap. And you put one or two of them in there and give them a good shake as well as give them a stir. Fill them down with a little bit of water and you'll, you'll get them hopefully as nice as e even. What I will say about these particular ones is the pigment. The pigment is absolutely beautiful when you paint. Um, you do get some really nice to black in this. Um, and also there's one called uh, Olive Brown. So these two in front, you've got the black, ice black green. You've got Olive Brown, a little bit dusty. Uh, the pigment in there is beautiful, really nice. And the yellow is nice as well. Uh, you get three or four different flu fluoro colours. Again, go and check them out. There's loads to choose from. N nice big range, aqua colour. Don't get much uh, in the way. I think it's about 18 mil. Yeah, 18 mil. So you don't get much in now. So, I mean, they are expensive for the amount you get. So I think I'll pay 220 each, something like that. The more you buy, the cheaper it becomes. But, you know, they, they can be a little bit... Um, they can be a bit expensive for what they are. But, yeah, with these ones, as you can see, I've got them on a stand. As so I have a, a big stand over here. These are the ones I like to use. So... I'll talk you through, because they all look very similar. Um, there's two different brands there. Uh, I'll pick two random ones up. Let me pick uh, this one up and this one up. Now, they're both made from the same company, Art uh, Deco Art. Uh, you've got the Crafters Acrylic and you've got the Americana. I think the Americana is a little bit um, more expensive, not too much. I think they're 150 to two pound a tube, depending on where you go and where you look. Again, because I buy mine from uh, eBay, I tend to get, like, if you buy a two, uh, I think it's buy a three or four, you tend to get the, the fourth one free. So I tend to do it that way. Um, these are very similar colours, although they don't look it. They're quite similar in, in coloration. Um, really nice pigment. You do get quite a bit for, well, I'll say 59 mil for um, for that, that couple of quid that you're paying for it. Again, if you look around in all these sort of home bargain places, pound shops, for a water-based acrylic paint, you will find similar brands, if not this brand at all, uh, if not this brand, should I say, you will get uh, very, very cheaply. You'll pick up for, I don't know, a pound of tube, 50p a tube. It's all about looking around. It's exactly the same I'll probably say with the threads a little bit later on. You, it's all relevant to how much you want to spend and how much you're willing to look around. Um, but I don't have time to mess around hunting around for bargains too much. And, and what I like about getting them off eBay is I can get a real good um, a real good mix of coloration that I like. So again, these are the two that I tend to predominantly use, uh, the Americana and the Craft crafters acrylic i do like the americana the, the the pigment in there is so nice so so nice um so if we just put those to one side you know i've got pinks i've got blues i've got yellows i've got greens olives and you know it's all different colors there from honey color i've got three different types of gold at the top you know there's just so many different colors you know you can see the neon colors here for painting tips now the ones at the bottom you probably see here you can see that's a little bit, uh, you can see it's pink at the bottom. You need a, a proper good shake, and then you obviously get the proper colour from it. Um, put a couple of ball bearings inside, like I said earlier on, and you will be able to shake and mix the paint up. These particular paints, these Wicked colours from uh, Createx colours, they are, they're, they're airbrushing paint, really. You can use normal acrylic in an airbrush. I don't really want to get in depth with airbrushing, um, but you can use acrylic paint for airbrushing. Um, but you really do need to thin it out. So it's best to actually go and buy proper airbrush paint because it's so much easier to use, especially like me as a newbie to airbrushing. But um, yeah, these are a bit more pricey. You're probably looking around a four pound, four, between four and six pounds, depending on the brand and the quality you're buying and the amount as well. You know, again, these are about, I don't know, 60 mil or something like that. This is fluorescent pink. So they're good for doing tops and tips and stuff like that on your on your floats. So have a good look around. You know, that's just a, a little selection of the paints that I've got and what I use. Uh, I'm always expanding. I'm always buying more. And, and if you're just a basic float maker, who's just making them for yourself, maybe for a few friends of yours, then, you know, you, don't, you ain't got to go mad and buy loads of different paints and spend lots of money on them. But um, I like to have a good little selection to choose from over there. And, and like I say, I will be buying more to go with it. The one last thing to talk about, really, other than, you know, paints is, uh, is dyes. Dyes is something I've not really mixed around with too much. Um, as you can see, I've, I've dyed a couple of uh, bodies. 
on the uh, on these particular floats that I've not finished yet. Um, I like to use Color Run. Color Run. The reason why I use Color Run is because across the road from where I live uh, is a home base, literally two minute two minutes from where I live, and they sell this brand. And it does six or seven different, uh, six or seven maybe eight. I'm not sure of different uh, colors. Um, this particular one here is American Walnut. Walnut, as you probably gathered, is one of my favourite colours um, in terms of uh, the stems and the wood. So I actually went and bought the dye to actually dye the bodies. They do need another coat. Um, you can have it as light or as thick as you want on, on the floats. This particular one, I'm going to just do a gradient from the bottom upwards. So I'm going to put it a little bit darker at the bottom so it gets lighter as it goes up. Um, so yeah, they're not finished. They're nothing to do with the project we're doing at the moment. Our float's just there, and uh, like I say, um, I'm going to prime the top, which we're going to talk about now. Um, I'm going to show you how I prime it, and then I'll show you how to paint afterwards. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. Painting's very easy. Okay, folks, so what we've done is uh, we finished sanding it and sealed it. We've done it three times. Um, there is drying time in between, so make sure you've got other things you can do around the house. I don't know if you're tidying up, doing whatever it is you're doing. You know, if you pop over the shops or whatever it is, you know, because there is drying times in between. This is what makes flow making uh, a long process because of the drying times in between uh, and the amount of coats you have to give things. And, you know, it's the effort that goes in, not just the amount of money you can spend on this, although you can keep it on a cheap budget, as I keep talking about. Um, it's the time that you spend actually making them. So, um, you can make them as, uh, as, as cheap as you want to. And you can make them as quick as you want to, but you know it's it's the time-consuming part, which uh, is is the most uh, frustrating thing. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to start off before anything else. I like to paint a base coat on the tip. Now, if I'm going to do uh, a light colour on the stem or on the float, other than the tip, then you need to put that on as well. So, say for instance. Um, the reason why, well, let's just start with why we put a, a, cut, a white base coat down first. The reason why we put a white base coat down is because you want the colour to really shine up. Now, if I was going to do a black tip, then there's absolutely no reason or any reason at all to put white underneath it. The reason why you put any white underneath any of your coats is because you want the bright colour to shine out. So if you want to use yellows, reds, light blues, light greens, pinks, um, neon colours, in order for them to fluoresce, in order for them to shine through, then you need to have a white undercoat for them to stand out. So, you know, like I say, it's all about how you, you prep your floats and, and getting these small little details right in order for your floats to, to really work. Rather than just sort of paint one colour over the top, it's not going to really stand out. So, as an example, this one's going to have a, fl a fluorescent tip, or at least a majority of it's going to be fluorescent. So I may use red, yellow, gr orange, green. I've not decided as of yet. Uh, we'll decide as we go along. Uh, I want to keep it traditional because it is basic. Uh, I want to keep it as basic as possible as well. Um, but I also want you to see at the end of the video just how you can make these look quite nice. Um, so what we're, we're going to talk about really briefly before we do that, I'm just going to move that to one side, put the float down here, um, is the type of uh, primers you can use now. I like to use gesso. This is uh, Liquitex You know, I'm not sponsored by any of these uh, items you see and everything I've shown you on the video I buy with my own money um, This is gesso Liquitex you can use any type of gesso or primer some people use emulsion You know, it's entirely up to you. All you're trying to do is put down a really cheap base coat color really to, in order for your um, your float to, to stand out um, what I like about this and what I like about gesso is it gives it a bit of tooth. So once it's dried, it gives it tooth for the other paint coat to go over the top and really stick to. So this is one I use. I'll give it a good shake before I start. Okay, let that settle for a moment. And then we'll come back and we'll paint the tip. Let me show you a tip uh, on another float that I've been working on to show you how it should look when it's finished. So I'm just going to grab one now. This is another float and this is what I'm talking about. So you painted the tip white. That's at about two or three coats, uh, and that's what we're going to achieve in a moment. And there is a way of trying. I mean, if you look there, you can see it's a fairly straight line. You know, it's very easy to get that wrong. So I'm going to show you a way how I do it, uh, and uh, I can't. Again, I can't take credit for it. 
you know, Gaz, Gary, uh, Gary, uh, Graham, <laughs> Graham Pinkerton, I keep calling him, I keep calling him Gary, um, Graham Pinkerton, he's, um, his video showed me the way to do it really and I'm sure there's loads of different ways and you may find your own, you may find your own way but it's just the way I do it and the way Gaz does it and, and it works for me as it works for him so let's just put that to one side really briefly uh, we're going to talk about paintbrushes you know I don't want to skimp on my paintbrush I like to spend a little bit more money on my brushes as I do with my paints now you can get any brush any brush will do the trick I think I've shown you these before when I was doing the um, when I was doing the sanding and sealing. These are really cheap paint brushes. These ones here, I think I think you can buy 15 or 20 of them for like 350 up to five pounds. Really cheap. Um, they're not the best quality paint brush. You know the hairs do come out that kind of thing. So when you're painting and you're using paints, you really want to get a decent brush. Really, these are like I say for epoxy and I know I do have epoxy brushes as well. Let me just show you those. These are epoxy brushes. Again, you can get them quite cheap. I think they're called acid brushes as well in America. Um, so, yeah, these are really cheap. You don't really want to be painting if you can help it with these, these particular type of brushes. Um, so, I go out and I like to buy some sort of half, de half decent brushes. Now, you've got these ones here. Let's just turn you around. These royals, these are really nice. What I like about them is they've got uh, a square tip. Now, if you have watched um, Graham's uh, videos, uh, Graham Pinkerton's videos, again, I'm going to leave a link in the corner so you guys can watch them. If you have watched it, then uh, you'll see he likes to use square. And it wasn't apparent at first when he was he first started making these, vi these videos and these floats why he used square, and I understand now. It, it, and as I show you, you'll understand as well. So put them to one side. Now, saying that, there is uh, times and you may use uh, a round tip. That's a round tip brush uh, for detailing, that kind of thing. Um, absolutely, if you want to draw lines, each call lines, they're really good. You can get these in even finer tips. I've got tips that are even finer than these two that I'm showing you now. Um, but these are really nice brushes as well. But you'll see that most of mine are pretty much square tips. You know, you'll see most of mine are all square tips. Uh, I prefer that, even tips with slants on. As long as they're square, they're the ones I, I kind of like using. Um, I don't like, these ones are quite nice, but the length of the handle drives me nuts. So I do prefer the shorter handle. <laughs> uh, it drives me nuts, a bit like fishing rods really. But um, these ones are slightly rounded at the tip, but they do the same job. So we're going to select one to start with for doing this... Uh, Doing this float, so we'll just put them to one side. Now we come back to the pad. So we've got the pad here. Remember, I've got all the holes in it. This is what I used when I was doing the sanding, sealing. Um, I've also made a hole at the side. Okay, and I'll show you the reason why. And it's really, really good idea. Again, I can't take credit for this. This is this is Graham's uh, idea. Well, so I believe. So let's give that a little shake up on the gesso. You can pour these into cups and stuff. I don't even bother. I just, uh, I just use it from the. Uh, I just use the brush straight, straight in. Okay. Also, incidentally, I got a cup of cheap plastic containers I use for putting my uh, water in. Just plain water, and that's for just uh, rinsing the brushes out. If you look after your brushes, as Gad says, uh, they look after you, and I, I'm inclined to believe that as well. Okay. So as you can see. I got a slanty tipped brush just there, uh, and we're going to uh, we're going to paint the tip on now. If it's a rounded, if you've got a rounded bulbous area, then um, having a square tip, what it does is it just gives a little bit of uh, control, so you can really get a nice square, even finish on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom you in, so you get a better look at what we're doing. Okay. So that becomes apparent why the hole's there. It's so I can twist the float as I paint at the same time. And as you can see, you're going to get a nice even, or as close to even finish as you can as you can want it, or as you can possibly do. So that's the reason why I have that hole there, because you can just twist the float, and it just makes. Imagine I've got paint on now. 
and you just twist the float and it just gives a nice even finish. It'll take you a little while to get used to it. What I like about this particular one that we made is I left a little ridge on there. So it will make putting the, the paint on a lot easier. Okay. You know, I'm not trying to teach you, trying to teach your grandmother to suck eggs or whatever that expression is. Um, because painting's painting, it's not hard. I'm just showing you a way that might make it easier for you guys. So just gonna load the uh, load the paint up. Not too much. Okay. And then what you want to you want it to be freely moving, but you want it to be as steady as possible. So what I'm gonna do is just pop it on now. Let's get the line and twist as I uh, paint. Okay, might not come out perfect first time round. You can also you can revisit what you've done. Slowly take your time. Now I've just gone over the edge there. Now don't mind going over the edge because later on when I come to put thread on now the thread will cover that up so you won't even see it. Now if you wasn't using thread then obviously you want it to be as neat as possible. Here we go. So I've just gone over the edge a little bit which I have been doing recently. Before I was a little bit anal about how I wanted it to be and how neat the line I wanted to be. Now if you was keeping this as your main line and you wasn't actually going to put no thread around it because what I originally did is I didn't bother putting thread around the tip of it uh, around the base of it so I wanted that white line to differentiate between the colour of the body and the colour of the tip so you imagine if the rest of the tip's red you wanted that white band sometimes I use, well I now use thread and you'll find on a lot of them so let me, let me grab another float for you and you'll see what I mean so this is another one I've made can you see that's a threaded band now that would originally be white but what I've done is I've actually bought white thread so you can actually do it with white thread if you want so if I take another one and you'll see what I mean see that one now is done with white thread and not white paint but you can leave it on with paint if you wanted to do it you know so it's a, an option of yours but at the moment we're just painting the tip so I've got that nice and even as, as much as I want it to be or as much as I can get it and then any sort of glomps, gloops, glomps, whatever you want to call them, bogies, there's all different names for them. You want to get it nice and even and then paint the tip. And like I say, this will take a couple of coats. Now there's a few bumps in there, a few lumps, but what I'll let that happen now is to dry this. So I'll let this dry off and then um, using our wire wall, or as I spoke about earlier on, our, um, let's just show you that as you can see it's very simple it's not difficult sorry about the camera work you can see it's fairly even not difficult at all I really do like this gesso it gives a really nice uh, coating and what it's done when it dries it will dry with a tooth on there so it becomes almost like um, it's not smooth because originally when I first started I used acrylic and it was so smooth and the paint that I put over the top the first one paint up over the top didn't bite to it didn't didn't stick to it uh, it wasn't very good and it was all blotchy so what I tend to do now is I use a, a lot better quality it takes a little while to look around it's a little trick for you a little tip there look around at the different types of uh, primers that you'll use but again I like to use gesso and that's the one I've got here so what we do it's very fast drying doesn't take long at all maybe half an hour so I'll leave that half an hour to dry off quick sand over the top and then I'll do another one or two coats on top of that so it'll probably be what three coats with sanding in between pretty similar to what I was doing with the uh, sander sealer so I'm going to switch off for the moment let that dry and then I'll come back when I'm ready to do the uh, the next part of painting okay just before we uh, the paint the tip the tip color on the float so it's actually dry now um, that's the white primer I've given it three coats and I have sanded it in between. So that's the white primer. Okay. So I've decided, obviously while I've been painting, I'm not going to paint the stem. Now you can paint that any colour you want, if you want to. Like I say, painting is relative to you and how you want your float to look. 
but I'm going to keep it quite traditional. So all I'm going to do is paint the tip, and then I'm going to whip up the wood. Now I don't know if that is coming through on the camera, but actually the, the wood grain is actually quite nice. Since I put that sander sealer on it, it's actually brought out some really nice grain in the wood. So all we're going to do is we're going to thread, we're going to whip this, very similar to a float that I showed you earlier on. Let's put this down for a moment. These two, these two finished ones. It's got my uh, my initial on it. These are early ones. They're not very good in terms of the initial, but forget that for the moment. So we'll turn those around so they're not too um, <laughs> they're not too uh, distracting. Um, but you can see these are very traditional looking type of uh, perch bobs, and this is what we're going to go for. So as you can see, I've got very different whipping up the um, up the shaft. Uh, and the colour of the tips are all one colour. This is a fluorescent red. This is a neon fluorescent red. And this is exactly what we're going to use. It's this one here. So neon red. You can get neon oranges and neon pinks and yellows. But we're going to use additional red. Um, that's what most people would you know, synonymize these particular floats with. Um, but again, you make them your own. So we're going to have a nice white band. Uh, maybe even a black band. I'm not too sure yet. Uh, we're going to have a red tip. And um, and then we're going to do some threading. I'm not sure what colour thread. Maybe even just black thread like they are on these ones here. I've got these floats which are finished floats. I've done quite recently. These are the perch ones I've made. Uh, with my own decal one. Um, there's the decals. I'm not entirely 100% happy with that decal. So I've actually changed it up a little bit. And I've made a new one. Again this is all relative to what you want to do. You can do the signatures you saw on the floats a moment ago, or you can put decals on. You don't have to put anything on at all. It's just to personalise your float, really. But we're talking about tips at the moment, so we're going to come back to that. So as you can see, this particular one here is an orange tip. It's actually orange paint. I don't know how well that's coming through on the camera. Uh, these ones here, these four here, are red tips. Uh, fluorescent red, so the fluorescent red that we're going to use, the neon red. And then this one here is actually a proper red, a real red red, like a, a fire engine red. So it's not fluorescent or anything, it's just a proper harsh red. And as you can see it looks really quite nice. So I would say that's even more traditional to have a flat colour, nothing that's actually neon. And there's nothing saying that you have to have a neon colour. I just think at certain times of the day and light conditions that might not fluoresce upwards. You know, I've got a pike float here which I'll show you. It's not finished. Uh, and that's got I don't know how well that's coming through. It's got a neon yellow on it. Doesn't look very neon on the camera, but it is, I promise you, a neon yellow. So, oranges, yellows, pinks, and reds. Pretty much what most people go for when they're, they're actually making their per, uh, perch bobs or pipe floats or whatever. But we're doing pipe floats at the moment, uh, perch bobs at the moment. So, if you have a look, you can actually see I've actually, if you look at this one here, I've got my finger on, it's all one colour. And that's what you'll see most standard perch bobs but if you have a look at these three here they're, they're, they're or these two here should i say they're very different you can see i've got a black tip on there a little bit of white banding and then another little red band underneath uh, black band underneath whereas this one's like black white black again this is all relative to how you want it the reason why i like having these little bandings what they do is as they they sit in the water you know below the water line you know the float below the water line you get to see, especially at a distance, if you haven't got very good eyesight like me, registered bites. A bit similar to uh, tench floats. Let me pull one of my tench floats out and you'll see what I mean. This is a tench float that I'm in the middle of making. But if, just by putting that extra little banding on at the top. So as you can imagine, that's sitting in the water upright. Um, and you have it just where the, where the red finishes there. If you get a lift bite like that, you see that pop upwards, you know, you know you've got a lift bite, and it's pretty similar to these. They give a, a nice indication. Rather than just having one colour, they give a nice indication of a bite. And also they look very different and they're quite nice and unique. But what we're gonna do for argument's sake and for the video's sake, I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm just gonna keep it to one colour. Um, but like I say, you've you've got so much options that you want to do for your own floats that you can you can give these different tips. You can have two different colours if you want to as well. I mean, there's quite a few floats I've made with you know this one as an example. Again, it's not finished. You, you can see it's finished with black banding, but it's a yellow bottom and a red tip. 
So it's all relevant to how you want your float to look and what you're looking for. On your particular waters, you may fish clear waters, you may fish muddy waters. So it's all relative to that really. So I thought I'd show you a couple of tips um, before I actually paint them. Um, and like I say, our particular one, let's move these out of the way. Our particular one, this one here, we're just going to paint all red. Very, very simple. You saw me a minute ago um, paint the white on top and it's just exactly the same, just putting the red over the top. What you want to do is try and keep it nice and even. It'll probably take a good couple of coats just to get just to get it to go on. When you see the paint for the first time, it doesn't look very bright. It's quite dull, but when it starts to dry and you put, start putting the coats on top, then it really does start to fluesce. So that's what we're going to do next. So just join me in a moment while I get everything prepared. Right, folks, so we're back with our paint. So we, like I say, we've chosen the uh, this Neon 1, Art Deco Neon. Like I say, it really doesn't matter what colour you're going to choose. in terms, As long as you get a nice uh, bright colour for your tips. Um, but this one's the Neon Red, and this is what we're going to go for. Okay, so I'll give it a good shake. I use quite a lot of this stuff. It looks very pinky, um, this particular colour, um, before you put it on. So um, let me grab a brush. I've got the wrong brush. So I've got another square tip brush, as you can see there. It's a lot smaller than the other one. I'm not sure what mil is. Maybe 6 mil, 5 mil, something like that. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the uh, exactly the same way as I did with the white. So just load up the float, uh, load up the uh, brush, sorry, and uh, just bring that nice and uh, even. You can see that. Um, yeah, and just take your time with it, pushing the paint round. Try and get it as even as you possibly can, and as smooth as you can. Like I say, the more you do this, the better you'll become. Don't expect it to look perfect first time round. You will make mistakes, as I have throughout this video. And I've been making floats for nearly a year. And I continue to make them. I've not got very good eyesight anymore. Um, I wear glasses, more so. So I've just, as you saw there, I've just laid the float down, as I did with the white. You know, I turned it around as I was painting the paint on. So you've got to be careful not to, to put too much on. You want it to be even as you possibly can. Uh, just paint up the tip. Make sure you hit the ends. Now it will look blotchy to start with. It's just the, the way this paint is. Uh, again, you can sand it if you want to, but I'd rather not. Just push the paint around. Try and get it as even as you can. And then the next coat that goes on, subs substance or oh, I can't say the word um, as you start to build up the layers of the uh, paint I mean it doesn't look very nice on there it doesn't look nice at all but trust me the more you build up layers and drying times in between um, looks actually quite horrific if I'm being honest but like I say once you start putting more layers on letting it dry a drying time you may need five coats of this possibly three to five coats um, the more you lay on the more even it will become you don't want to push it about too much because what will happen is, is that you'll you'll push the paint off and you'll find that you're very difficult to, to get that paint back onto that one area again because of the tooth underneath on the primer. So we'll leave that to dry. And um, yeah, we'll leave that to dry. And we'll come back in a minute. And... Uh, like I say, on you, when I showed you the other floats, you can put a black tip on it. You can leave a little bit of white and just paint the tip black. It's, it's all relative to how you want it to be. So I'm just going to have it one colour for now. You can see I didn't leave a white band on now, on purpose, because we're going to use thread to do that. That's the one thing we are going to use slightly differently. We're going to use thread to do that. So I'm going to get the, the tip painted up. And once it's fully fluorescent and I'm very happy with it we'll come back we'll show it to you and then we'll start to put thread on the shaft and you know the flow will really start to come together but again I'm keeping this very very basic I haven't painted it up like all my other floats I've shown you I just wanted to keep it really basic um, very easy build and you can paint it to how you want it to be okay so I'll be back in a little moment show you the tip and then we'll start on the threading Okay, so we finished the painting. Now, as you can see, I've only painted the tip, as I spoke about. Now, you can see some overspill just around the edge there, but I'm not too worried about that because we're going to cover that up with some thread later. 
So I'm going to keep this traditional, as I said. I was going to paint the stem, and you know, you can be over elaborate. And you've seen in um, in previous uh, clips in this video that the colours you can get. So I want to just keep things very, very simple. Keep this very traditional uh, and keep it so you guys can you can mimic it yourself, really. So I've just painted the top. That's probably had about four or five coats. Uh, I've just painted the top uh, fluorescent red, as you saw, the neon red. You can see the more coats you put on, the more fluorescent it's come out. It's just drying off slightly, a little bit left to dry. But in the meantime of us talking, it's a very dry, um, very fast drying coat. So in the meantime of us talking, it'll, uh, it'll end up drying fully. So what we want to talk about now really is, um, is dressing it. Uh, dressing it to make it look a little bit, I don't know, come to life, shall we say. Now, like I say, I'm going to keep it simple, so I'm going to use basic colours. But I am going to talk you through the threads and the whipping and everything. Um, and once we've selected what we need, then I will show you how to thread. Okay, so first things first. I have a little collection here of safety pins and wire. So you can see I've got four different wires there, coloured wires I like to use. I like to keep things simple with a wire. I don't like to, to, um, to have over elaborate colours. At the end of the day, it's just an eye on the float. Now, like I said before, you don't necessarily need an eye, but I am going to whip one on here for, uh, for, for, for purposes that you guys can learn, and also it's quite traditional. Uh, you can see I've got four different size safety pins in three different colours, gold, silver, and black. I've took the liberty already to change, so not, not change, but check the size uh, for the end of the float uh, as to what fits, and I've got a gold, silver, and black. So what I've also took the liberty to do is I've chosen the black. As you can see just there. I'm using a pair of wire cutters. These are my cutters. I cut my wire for my pike fishing. I've trimmed off the end of the uh, safety pin. And just left the, the bottom part. As you can see there. And that's what we're going to use to go on the bottom of the eye when we rip on. I've chosen black because, again, I'm going to show you the thread in a moment. I'm trying to keep everything very, very simple. So, that's the eye prepared. Very, very simple to do an eye. Like I say, you can use the wire yourself and you can you can twist it around, uh, something round or any shape you want really. That's the beauty of making your own eyes with wire instead of having safety pins. Um, but traditionally, a lot of people use safety pins and it's been used for donkey's years and it's, again, very easy and readily available for you guys to use. So, yeah, with the uh, wire, you can you can make it any size you want, really. You can oversize the eye, you can have it smaller. It's entirely up to you. And as you see with these uh, pike floats hanging up, as an example, you see they've all got eyes on of various sizes and whipped on. Some are in different uh, processes of drying. So uh, drying in terms of their lacquer that they've had on. Anyway, so let's have a look at the threads. Now, threads come in various different forms, various different sizes and amounts. Um, of yardages now these particular ones uh, are called uh, gutterman silks they're very very fine they're beautiful as you can see in their colorations i've got various different colors of golds browns greens absolutely beautiful i've got specific fly tying tools uh, like bobbins we use bobbins for actually uh, weighting the uh, thread so it's easier some people just actually hold the thread themselves and wrap the thread around the uh, float. I prefer using the bobbins um, because I just think it gives you a little bit more control. Uh, not only that, they're weighted, so I can use the weight of the bobbin and, and the actual uh, thread itself to be able to, to hang. You'll see what I mean when I, I show you how to, uh, how, or how I thread a float uh, and whipping. Uh, I've got some fly tying scissors. I don't like using normal scissors because they, they leave frays. The other important tool here that you'll see me use a little bit later on, which is not in front of us, is a crafting knife. Very, very, very sharp crafting knife. It's so we don't leave any frayed ends, really, when we're um, when we're putting our lacquer over the top of the, the thread. Uh, if you've got frayed ends, they tend to frap up and sit upright, and they cause all nastiness and little bumps and stuff like that. So, But yeah, these are Gutterman silks. Uh, really, really nice. Very thin thread. Beautiful colours, as you can see. Um... Let me show you some other threads that I like to use um, really briefly while we're here. 
remember these are more expensive probably really expensive um, you can actually go out and buy threads polyester threads and that really really cheap you know some threads are going to be better than others if you're going to buy them from tackle shops for for rod building because a lot of these are rod building threads that you can use for float making the rod building ones i find are a little bit thicker um, in their gauge they'll come in grade a and grade d uh, i have both uh, silk threads are probably a lot better they lay flatter on the float so if you're doing a float that's um not a pike float or a perch float but something a little thinner like a, a tench float or a crucian float with a bit more finesse and detail you're better off with having a very very fine thread um i like to use uh fuji threads fuji threads if i can get it out fuji threads are, are very fine silky tight threads absolutely lovely lay flat uh you can see i've got chestnut brown and browns metallical colors you know, this kingfisher blue, it's beautiful, electric, golds and reds, yellows, silvers, really, really nice. This is my Fuji box with all my Fuji threads in. Um, very, very fine, and I've, I've, I've got to admit, I'm actually turning onto the thinner threads more than I am the thicker threads that I've been using of recent times. So, the other threads that I use more than anything, which I'm going to show you now, are my Hawk threads. Um, I absolutely love the hawk threads, the fish hawks. Been using them quite a while. You can see they come in various different colours. Uh, there are different thicknesses in here, like I say, grade A and grade D. You've got them orange is really vibrant, really stand out well. Blues, purples. I've not used the purple of yet, or the browns. Greens are really nice as well. You can see absolutely beautiful colours. The black I actually go through quite a lot because black is the, the dominant thread I like to use. Um, but what I as I said before, I find that these are a little bit thicker, um, a little bit beadier. So you have to put more lacquer on over the top to kind of take the rigidness off of uh, the thread because obviously it's a, a thicker thread. Um, but I have been doing things with uh, rods recently, so it's not just the floats. But yeah, very pleased with these. These are my basic colours, the primary type colours. And then I have metallics and silvers and stuff like that. Pinks, silvers, metallical blues and greens and golds. You know, there's just so much to choose from choice-wise. And, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. This little selection here is, is quite expensive. It's cost me quite a bit of money. But um, I think it's because I'm getting into float making. So I don't mind spending the money. And if I do start to uh, sell floats, which I haven't decided to yet, then, the, um, then they'll pay for themselves. But up till now, I've got to stick to... Uh, Stick to getting sort of finer threads. I find that these Gutterman silks are a lot cheaper as well. Um, absolutely beautiful. I've shown you these, but really, really nice. I do prefer them to be on the um, the bobbins like that as opposed to like this because they fit in the bobbin uh, threader a lot easier. Um, but yeah, so that's the uh, threads I like to use. And like I say, you don't have to go out and buy all these threads for expensive prices. You can go out and you can buy threads really, really really good prices uh, if you look around and, i mean you can pick up sort of i wouldn't say cotton threads you've got to be really careful with cotton threads because they snap quite easy but you can pick up threads 50p a pound if you look around you've got to remember if you're just starting off you don't want anything expensive it's just this is the process i i use and then if you want to upgrade to get these nice beautiful colors and stuff i mean these ones here are not expensive at all compared to the the the, the fish hawk and the fujis now i have selected Color threads I am going to use and like I said I'm going to keep this very simple um, this is the bobbin tire I'm going to use and these are the two threads so the Fuji in white which I'm going to put around um, obviously I'm going to put around the collar of the float and I may stick a little tiny bit uh, at the base of the tip just to give a little bit of different sight indication as you saw on the floats earlier that I showed you with uh, the paint, different painted coloured tips. But you can actually achieve that using thread as well. So I'm going to put a little band of white there and a little band of white there. Um, and the rest of the float just down on the shaft is going to be black. And that's the fish hawk black. So what we'll do, without further ado, I'm going to get everything set up. And uh, we'll come back and I'll show you how to whip the eye on. And also show you how to you know, put a spire up the float. It's not very difficult. It just takes a little bit of practice. Um, I was very lucky to catch on very very first time i've done it but uh, you guys i'm sure will pick up quite quickly so i'll see you in a bit with everything set up okay so we're back to do some whipping um just before i do i'm just going to talk you through something really quickly um these floats that you've seen throughout the video uh both episodes you can see that um these are very 
basic traditional styles. They've got very slightly different uh, shape bodies, but they're pretty much similar to what they are. One slightly smaller than the other. Um, you can see they obviously they're finished in varnish, but I wanted to show you basically what we're going to go for. Um, the similar look that we're going to go for on our finished float. So I'm just going to bring this pike float in because I want to show you what I'm going to create on the top. So if you look at this pike float, you can see it's got a white band uh, around the around the base of the uh, fluorescent colour and then one at the top. You know, you see the perch ones don't have it, but the pike one does. Well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create the pike one on our, our perch bobber that we're working on at the moment. So just going to show you basically, like I say, what I wanted it to look like. Um, if you look at the bottom now, you can see an eye whipped on, and that's another thing we're going to do as well. So I'm going to show you how to whip the eye on, and then how to thread up the float. But off camera, I'm actually going to create the white around the um, uh, white around the actual uh, base and the tip. Um, the reason why I'm not showing you that because I don't think it's really necessary to keep showing you all the different whippings. A whipping is a whipping. So once I show you how to do it once, it's very similar how to do it anywhere else on the float. The one thing I, I tend to do when I start the whipping off on the um, the base, I tend to put a little tiny drop of glue uh, and then I stick the thread to that and leave it settle for a couple of minutes before I start the whipping because it's a, a little bit more difficult actually putting the uh, thread around the, the middle of a, a large round uh, bulbed area like that than it is actually down the stem. Uh, so it's a little bit more difficult, but that, that will come with practice. But I'm going to take the liberty now, actually off camera, just to, to put the white banding on our float we're working on. And then I'm going to bring you back. And as you can see there, uh, let's just hold these for you. There's two different types of uh, just standard spiralling. This is what we call spiralling in the float hobby. Um, you can see I've spiralled all the way up that one. Just give a little band there, a little band now. And then you can see there's a little band there, uh, a little break, and then another band but it's basic spiraling it's not very difficult to do it's it's one of those basic things that you can you can practice on a, a piece of dale you know get yourself a piece of uh, or a pencil or anything like long thin and rounds you know just practice on it before you actually do your floats if you're a little bit worried but practice makes perfect perfect i was i've done a lot of research like i say watching other videos and i picked it up fairly straightforward and fairly quickly uh putting the eye on can be a little bit fiddly but we'll talk about that as we do it and there's little tips you know you can you can do to, to keep that on now but um yeah i'm going to bring you back in a moment what i'm going to do in the top right hand corner again i'm going to put up a, a link to a couple of people's uh channels go and watch their videos so you've got uh, Graham's Graham Pinkton's the float hut. I'm going to stick that up there. I'm also going to stick up the uh, handmade fisherman as well. Uh, another guy that I'm, I, I proper look up to when it comes to making tackle. Um, he's absolutely fantastic at what he does. So go and have a, a look at him. He he shows you how to whip his way. Everybody does it slightly differently. So. I'm only showing you how I do it, so don't take for gospel that this is how it has to be done. You will find your way, and um, yeah, just go and have a look at some of the others if you want to see how they whip. But I'm going to bring you back in a moment with that, with our float, uh, where I'll have the white all finished, and then we'll start whipping up the black. Okay, so I've taken the liberty, like I said, off camera to actually put the uh, white banding on. As you can see, it really stands out now. You can imagine that in the water bobbing away you know with a worm underneath absolutely fantastic i really cannot wait to try this now it's come along really well i'm really pleased with it and like i said it can look really rough and ready until you dress it up and when you dress it up and then you've got that final lacquer coating over it, it really brings it to life so if you think that it's not looking too good or not too well and you want to scrap it and and uh, start a new project start another one seriously don't stick with it and trust me once you start dressing it up, like I say, and you put the, the lacquer on, it really will come to life. It really will. Um, so without further ado, as I've done the white banding on this particular one, as you can see, really, really nice. Stands out well. We're going to start on the black whipping. Now, just before I do, put that down. just going to show you a few of the tools. I think I may have mentioned it already, but I'm going to really briefly show you what I'm going to use. Secret weapon. I've been using this glue for quite a while now. A lot of float makers use this. This is Gorilla Glue, and it's not like any other super glue. It's like a gel, so it doesn't run. There's nothing worse than using runny super glue and sticking your fingers together. Because this is a gel, it's like gloopy, and it gives you that. I mean, it still sets fairly fast. I wouldn't say as fast as normal super glue, but it sets fairly fast in 30 seconds to a minute. 
uh, but it's absolutely fantastic stuff. I couldn't live without this. This is a, a seriously one of those uh, pieces of uh, one of those pieces of kit for this kind of uh, float making. That I couldn't do without. I actually buy quite a lot of this at a time. You're probably looking at about five, six quid. If you look around, you can pick it up like me a little bit cheaper on eBay. Um, so that's the glue, craft knife, as I've alluded to. You can use a Stanley knife as well. I like using the craft knife. It's very, very, very sharp, um, very easy to use, and you can, you've got a lot of control on this. So you've got a craft knife, uh, very cheap pair of uh, force, not forceps, uh, <laughs> um, uh, ply, uh, pliers, forceps. What am I talking about? Tweezers. I like these curved ones, and you'll see the reason why in a little while. Again, it's very, they're very sneaky. A really nice pair of. Uh, pair of tweezers that I bought for about 59p off of eBay but you look around you can get little sets of these for like two pounds on eBay uh, very expensive pair of uh, decent fly tying scissors I like these ones uh, particularly because they're they're called Dr. Slicks uh, a lot of fly tires use these very sharp and they cut through very fine thread without leaving too much fraying very very deep it's always worth getting yourself a decent pair I mean you can use normal scissors if you want to um, but these uh, if, were well worth the investment if you're into your float building and then you've seen the bobbin and I've got black thread on now we're gonna be using black thread fantastic prefer black thread um, more than anything with all my float making because it really just makes things stand out um, and it's quite traditional now I have got another piece of thread um, this is just a, a normal piece of blue thread. Um, this will cut, become apparent. It's just it's just a length of thread, uh, doubled over, and this will become apparent in a little while why I use this. Okay, so keep that to one side, and then obviously we've got our eye that we created earlier, our safety pin where it's been cut at the top, so it's been cut, and it's all ready to be whipped on. Now, you can. So if we grab the float you can hold it on and then start whipping now I find actually just putting a little bit of dab of glue on now so let's grab some glue pop that down for a moment and open the glue up a little bit of glue a lot of people don't do this or like doing this it's just how I I mean I'm just showing you how I do things so if we get it nice and square get it perfect no rush a little dab of glue try not to stick your fingers together Remember this this stuff dries very quickly. I am gonna just smoothen it out of my finger. It's not the best thing to do. And that will dry really quickly. And that'll just hold the eye in place for when you're whipping. So if we just leave that for a moment, and why I'm uh, just holding that there for a minute. Um, if you go onto uh, the top right hand corner, again, I'm gonna stick a link up for a couple of uh, tackle makers that are on YouTube one is obviously Graham Pinkerton uh, you've seen me put the link up a few times I'm going to stick it up again uh, the other one is a guy called um, Paul Adams uh, I love Paul when I first started getting into tackle making he was one of the, the go to people that I watched on, on his videos um, really really good at what he does he's, he's the handmade fisherman that's the name of his channel he doesn't just make floats and um, he's really into his lures so he makes a lot of lures he's just started working for Harrison as well uh, Harrison um, uh, Rob Blanks uh, up in Liverpool he's just started working for their factory and I couldn't be more pleased for him if I'm being honest he shows you how to whip rods and you know make lures and all sorts on his channel he's really really good he's so watching these videos I find him very very relaxing um, so seriously go and check out Paul Adams I'm a big fan of his as he knows um, and he shows you how he does his whipping and like I say everybody does their whipping very different to everybody else so let's just check again super glue it's just held it in place only one or two small little blobs now if that was runny super glue that would have run everywhere whereas one or two little blobs of the gel just smoothing it out I did use my fingers not the best thing to use you can see none of my fingers are stuck together um, and it's just smoothed it out and uh, there you go it's in place the eye now let's just give it a little bit more of a, a firm fixing so that gives me now time and play I haven't got to hold that while I start the threading now this is the really tricky part is doing the threading I knew this is going to be off a camera, so please bear with me. The camera work might not be brilliant, but I'll try my best. Now, okay, let's bring you a little bit closer, if 
I can. Right, so we've got our thread on our bobbin. I've got a little bit hanging off. What we want to do is we want to start down the float shaft towards the body, and we want to wrap around a couple of times up towards the up towards the whip. Okay, and this is the reason why I like the 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 uh, the thread bobbin. It holds everything in place. You know, hands free. I've got one hand free, and it, I've got exactly where I want it for the moment. Okay, and that's the reason why I like these. It's it's using its own weight to keep everything in place. Now, if you don't and you, you do it by hand, you've got to keep everything tight, and you need both hands for what you're doing. So, what I'm going to do is just going to pinch that, bring my other hand up, okay, and I'm going to inch a little bit closer towards the end. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to whip around by the eye. This is how I do it. I go. I like to go around a couple of times. And this is why I like the bobbin. It's the control. You can see I can just drop it and be hands free on my right hand. Because I'm right handed, you may be left handed, you'll do it the other way around. And then what I do is get a couple of whips around the bottom. So everything's in place. As you can see. And then I draw off a load of thread and drop it between my legs. Yeah? And then what I do is I come back. So I'm still hands free on the right hand. And then what I do is I start to gently let's, let's zoom this in if I can. I told you this is a little bit fiddly. I start to wind up. Don't know if you're picking this up. Just making sure everything's flush. And then what I do is I take the tag end if I can. <laughs> Grab the scissors. Doesn't matter if there's a long leading bit off because it's not the end of the whip. Okay. As you can see there. I don't know if you can see that. Let's uh, back off a little bit. I knew this was going to be hard to film. There we go. So I do apologise. This is going to be very difficult to film. And then what we do is we start whipping up the float. Try not to leave any gaps. I'm using my right hand as a controller. The way the bobbin's pulling between my legs as I'm using the weight of the float. Uh, sorry, the weight of the bobbin to draw it up. Again, you will find your own way of doing this. Try and make sure there's no gaps if you can. I'll show you what to do afterwards if there's a very few small gaps. But as I'm looking down on this and just drawing it up, you'll see the bobbin actually come up. All I'm doing is twisting the float, just checking there's no gaps as I'm bringing it up. You can see it's fairly simple. Once you've got used to doing it, you can see there. Once you get used to doing it, it becomes fairly simple. What's good is there's a light coloured um, wood underneath so I can actually see. You can see the, the bobbin will be coming up in a moment. Okay, so there's the bobbin. And what we can do is just pull off another length, drop it between my legs, and go again. Now I can see a few gaps starting to form. Now you can wait till afterwards, but I like to start in there using the tweezers. I like to just rub it along and that just evens out the gaps. If you do get a big gap like that one, you see that big gap there? If you do just unwind and start, not unwind completely, unwind to where the gap is and just restart again. Simple as that, it's not, it's, it is difficult for beginners it is difficult but trust me when you get your eye in and I, I, I kind of picked it up first time but yeah I was making mistakes I do make gaps from time to time even now now I could speed this up to make it very quick but I think threading I'm really sorry about the camera work but threading is one of the, the ones that I wanted you to learn it, it can be quite difficult now we've actually gone I don't know if you can see that. 
we've actually gone over the um, the ends of the uh, the cut off parts of the eyes. You can see there's a gap there. So let's see if we can. Uh, there we go. Just by using the end of the tweezers, or you can use anything soft, a pen, a biro, the end of the tweezers. Just to make sure it's not sharp. Just run it along, and it'll open the gap up. So it just makes it nice and neat. There we go. Now, what I would normally do, you can see the eyes on there. What I would normally do is spiral up. But to start with, I'm, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a break. So what I'm going to do is, remember that piece of thread I showed you earlier on? That odd piece of thread? Okay. What we're going to do is, I'm still using the weight of the bobbin to hold this down. Using that piece of thread, we're going to go underneath and trap it. So we're going to trap the thread. Do if you can, oh, bit fiddly. So we come underneath, and we're trapping the thread. Give it one or one or two turns. That's it. So we've got it trapped. So I can just show you. There we go. So I've got a loop on one side, and I've got the two frayed ends on the other. Okay. So what we do is we then whip up. I'll probably say six or seven times. If you do it a couple of times, two or three times, it may unravel once I've done it. Sorry about the camera work once again. It's very difficult doing this on camera. So I've threaded that about seven times. Then what you want to do, this is the important part. This is where things can go completely wrong. Okay. So you want to use your left hand to hold the whole knot, including the thread. Okay. So it's still, you know, my right hand's free. So let's uh, zoom back out on this one so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. So I've held the whole knot. So there's, there's the uh, bobbin. You know. Because I'm, I'm trapping it between my fingers, there we go. Just going to pop that down, cut the bobbin off. Okay, so I'm now detached from the bobbin, but I'm still holding it with my fingers. Now, this is the important part, this is where it can get a little bit fiddly. Using the tweezers, I go through the hole. So I've gone through the hole the blue, of the blue thread. I've grabbed our black thread that I've cut off. And I'm pulling it back through the hole of the blue thread. Okay, so you've now pulled the main thread, the black thread, black back through the blue thread. So it's it's trapped inside it. I'm still holding it with my fingers. And then what you want to do is you want to grab the two uh, frayed ends of the blue thread and pull while holding holding your black thread. So it's not unraveling. And as you pull like that, pull it tight okay and to, this is one completed thread pull that's not unraveling now because what you've done is you've actually pulled your own thread back through itself and then the rest of the coils are keeping it in place don't know if you can see that I'm really sorry for the camera work I knew this was going to be a really tricky part of the video it's really difficult to see with black thread and that's why I wanted you to see the links of the other people because I think they explain it a little bit better than me. And then all you need to do now is um, using your craft knife, just trim it as close as you can. And that's one completed whip. Uh, what you can also do, like you saw me do with the tweezers earlier on, is use the tweezers and just very gently buffer the buffer the um, the whipping and there we go all finished what you can also do with that is you can actually paint get some black paint and just paint over that thread if you want to and what it does is it soaks in and any of the small gaps that you see in between like there's a little bit of a gap there can you see I can put a bit of black paint in there and, or you know a permanent marker or something and people would never know you would never know by looking at it okay so that's the eye whipped on and all we're going to do is decorate the rest of it so we're going to start again I'm going to show you again this is a long part oh. of the video I made a hash of that one by dropping the bobbin so yeah what we're going to do is we're going to thread I'm going to use my fingers for this because I've got quite a bit left out up up the float 
I'm going to go around a couple of times trapping it trapping the thread on itself I'm going to cut off the tag end using our scissors so the way the bobbin is holding the thread and then what we do is like we did before I'm going to keep this one zoomed out this time just going to give it a little band trying to keep no gaps all gaps uh, out of the uh, whipping as I possibly can again you can bunch it together if you want to using your tweezers you can do this afterwards if you want, I like to do it during sometimes just keeping all the gaps uh, at a minimum you can see I've created a little band now what I'm going to do is I'm going to spiral up and I'm going to create the same band with a spiral, so we'll drop some more of the thread all you need to do is go at an angle let's make the spirals a bit tighter these spirals are a little bit too uh, so drop the uh, float at an angle I want the spirals to be quite tight so you can make the spirals as big or as small as you want to just by dropping it at an angle you'll see as you spin up some will close up some will be too open just drop back on it you can see I'm twisting it back on itself coming back again it's also the shaft is tapered which makes it a little more difficult and when you're finished and you're happy with the uh, the thread going up and then what we do is you just trap it again on itself just trap it on itself like you did when you started the whipping let's bring some more of that off now I'm making it look I'm making a bit of a hash of it but I'm also making it look a little bit easier than it actually is especially for beginners we grab our jaw thread and what we're trying to aim for so that goes underneath the same as we did for the uh, same as we did for the eye at the top we're trying to create you can see it's a lot thinner uh, we're trying to create the same thickness as that but we wanted to put the draw threading sooner or later because you want to get a couple of whips around so you can pull it back on itself I can see some gaps but I'm going to deal with them afterwards so we're trying to get it the same thickness of that band that's about right so again thumb and forefinger trapping everything grab your scissors cut the thread the black thread that we're whipping with find your your blue loop so you got remember you got your blue loop so you got your blue loop and you got your uh, your two uh, your two frayed ends you want to put your your tweezers back through grab the black thread through the blue loop it's a little bit fiddly There we go, pull your thread through, so it's through the hole of that blue one, and then you pull the two tag ends, that's pulling the uh, thread through, and there we go, that's that completed whip again. Pull it tight, grab your craft knife, trim. Again, like I said before, I could see some gaps. So we're going to treat the gaps. Really gently. Then you've got to go like a madman. And there we go. Complete. You can see where I'm going with this now. Now, it looks a lot better showing you it now because the camera work I'll be doing is really, really difficult. But you can see there. All I'm going to do now is do... An see that little gap there I'm going to mimic that there and just go up to the collar okay so I'm going to do that off camera because there's no point showing you again I've already shown you twice um, not only that I, I think I've done a bit of a, a not a very good job at showing you how to do the whipping it's very difficult to do it on camera 
Um, and like I say, if you go and watch the other guys, Graham, uh, the Float Hut, and uh, Paul, the Handmade Fisherman, they explain how to whip so much better than me. Um, trust me, please go and watch it because I've made a bit of a hash of this, I think, in terms of me showing you how to whip. But I'm going to finish off the float, just put a little collar on there, a little black collar, uh, maybe go up the float a little bit, and then we'll come back. And all we got to do then is um, lacquer it. I'll talk to you about lacquering, show you my drying process, and uh, uh, putting, a, putting the uh, signature on there. Okay, bring you back in a moment, folks. Right, folks, so it's the last part of the video, I'm afraid. I <laughs> hope you've all enjoyed it. So I'm just going to talk you through about clear coating um, and uh, signing the floats. I'm not going to clear coat today. I'm just going to talk you through what I do. Um, reason being is it's just too time consuming. This video is just going to go on and on and on. And I'm sure you guys are going to get bored. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk you through it and uh, show you the results and show you exactly what you need to do. Um, not very difficult at all. So as you can see, I've taken the liberty of putting BC 18 on now. So it's 2018 BC. So that's signed my float. Uh, that's the one we've made. Um, really pleased about it's come out um, there are loads of different pens you can use on the market for signing your floats what you must take into consideration is this needs drying time and this is the reason why i'm not clear coating it today i'm going to need to leave this probably two days three days for that um ink to dry and soak into the float before i can actually start um putting any type of uh any type of varnish over the top now the type of pens i like to use so if i just steady the camera and show you um these ones I use for my art anyway, because I do a lot of uh, artwork, designing tattoos and stuff like that. Um, this is the uh, Uni Pins, very fine marker. Uh, it's a pigment, a permanent pigment marker. You can get them various different, I was going to say breaking strains then, but I mean um, uh, very different uh, nib tips. This is a fine one, this is a 0.3 mil, and you can get them in 8s and 5s. You can get them in black, red and, black, red and blue, I like to obviously use black. Then you have these ones here, which are the Uni Ball, uh, the Uni 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 Posca, Posica, which are um, which are acrylic based. So this is acrylic based type of uh, paint pen. So you can get these in different colours. You can get black and silver and gold and white. White is what I use today. So you probably see it's this one here I used the white tip. Exact same stuff. The Uni Posica, really good pen. Uh, doesn't smell acrylic based water based and you need to give it some drying time as you can see it's come out quite nice on the float so that's those ones and then lastly the oil based ones which are these ones here the paint pens again made by the, all by the same company these are oil based got a bit of a smell to them these are uni paints you're probably looking at around two pound fifty each pen something like that give or take i think the more you buy you can buy them in bulk packs where you can get them uh uh, a little bit cheaper but they're the pens i like to do for signing my floats and as you can see our floats sign now so let's just take that float a moment and we'll come back to that move that out of the way right let's talk really really briefly about two different types of um the two different types of lacquers i like to use now the first one is this water bomb floor lacquer aqua coat sp gloss you can get this in um, various different types you can get it in uh, a matte finish as well but most people like their floats to be quite glossy so this one here is uh, like I say a waterborne flooring lacquer I, I get it from Smith & Roger you can find that on eBay not eBay sorry a uh, website it's a Scottish company and as you probably guessed that was recommended to me by uh, Ga Graham Pinkerton um, Gaz has helped me no ends when it comes to my float making and this was the stuff i started off with it's very runny it's water based as i say it takes about 10 coats on your float for it to be completely completely how can i put sealed shall we say so you need to give it at least 10 coats on now um whereas if you're using something a little bit different like epoxy clear coat this is the one i use at the moment this is the devcon home two tongue epoxy I've done a lot of research into what other parts of uh, our hobby entail. So I looked at rod builders, I looked at lure makers and what they use. And this clear coat epoxy is absolutely fantastic. It's not cheap. 
Uh, it's very difficult to work with. It's hard to work with epoxy clear coat because it can be very sticky. Things can go wrong very easy. And with the aqua coat, you can you can kind of um, you got play time. You got you, you can how can I put it? You can you can stop mistakes happening a lot easier than you can with this stuff. Now this stuff is again epoxy clear coat, so it's very difficult to use. It's a bit of a mild irritant, so make sure you put masks on and rubber gloves on when you're using it. Um, you need to get the reason why I like using this syringe type one is because it equals out the amount you pour in because it becomes it's two parts as opposed to one like this one. This is two parts. You need to have the equal amount. Again, with epoxy, you know it's it's incredible, incredibly hard once it's dried. You know this this takes ten coats as I said. This one here, I only take about two, maybe three coats maximum. Uh, only for big floats, I'll probably use three coats, maybe two coats on a perch bob, three coats on a pike float. What I like about this as well is um, it's so tough, it's so strong. You know, it, it doesn't crack once it's on now. It, it lasts virtually forever. Um, whereas with the aqua coat, you can chip it and knock it and, you know, so on and so forth. I like this stuff for smaller floats like crusions and, and um, roach floats and even floats that kind of thing but for for larger stuff like my my perch and my pike i like to use this stuff now that's showing you the two types of uh resins on epoxies and varnishes whatever you want to call them that's the two types i like to use uh you can see i've got acid brushes that i like to use with this stuff but it's the same with the clear coat get yourself some really cheap um get yourself some cheap brushes don't use expensive paint brushes because just wasting your money and your time now there's a couple of ways I like to actually uh, dry my floats. So first way is obviously the old foam pad you've seen me use before. Anytime I, I actually dry my floats, I like to do half and half. I never ever do the whole float at once. So as an example, we'll just take this float here. I will just imagine this is all painted up and it's all finished, um, ready for, for coating with a, a lacquer. Be it either one of the lacquers that I've showed you already. I will do one half and then do it three times with drying time in between. And then I'll flip it round and I'll do the other half. The reason being is because obviously if you do the whole float and you stick it somewhere to dry, it'll run into wherever you're sticking it to. So you can stick it in there and it'll run into there. As you can see, I made that mistake a while ago. Uh, and as you pull it out, it'll all the foam stuck to the bottom of the flow it's not very good at all so yeah make sure you uh just do half at a time so do three coats up the top and then turn it around once it's dry and then do three coats at the bottom and then do that 10 times with the aqua coat and then uh if you wanted to do it with the uh epoxy you know two or three coats so it's the best way to do it so you can use the old foam block the other way is if i take this foam block and stick it on top of this drying rack that i've made You've seen this in videos, probably in the background. Uh, it's not very difficult to make. Just a couple of pieces of wood. You know, one long piece of wood at the bottom to catch any drips. As you can see, there's not many drips on there at the moment. Um, you've got two side pieces with a, a cross piece at the top. So you've got a cross piece at the top I use as a shelf as well. Um, this piece inside is optional. I'll talk about that in a moment. But on the cross piece, you, you can see I've tacked in some nails. And the floats are hanging from that. That's another way you can dry them if you want to do it that way. The problem is you've got to be careful about, obviously, if you're using a epoxy, sagging down the float. So it'll be thinner at the top than it will at the bottom if it's hanging down. Um, but that's a way you can actually... Uh, so you can see these ones are not epoxied. And these ones are. You see how shiny they are. Inside, I'll put another piece of wood to, to brace this, support it. And I've even got some smaller, smaller ones to hang our float as an example and that's to to let our floats the smaller floats like perch floats dry at the back um, so it's a very versatile little uh, little thing i made there i'm quite pleased with it you know it's just cheap off cuts of wood that i found and uh cut it out with a saw a few uh few nails a few bits of uh, super glue and knocked it together it's not very difficult i didn't even judge sizing and i don't even know how long it is maybe 18 inches um, you don't need to, to worry about things like size and getting it all right and perfect. It's, as long as it's flat and you will put a spirit level on top and it lays flat and it's strong. That's all I'm looking for. And the other way of drying is probably the most, uh, most I wouldn't say the most complicated, but 
uh, it's basically a drying turner. Now, I've done a lot of research, like I say, with lure anglers and fly anglers and anglers that like to make their own lures and, and obviously flies, like pike flies and stuff. And I made this drying rack. So let me just plug it in and I'll explain it a little bit more. This has got a lot of people asking on uh, Facebook about this, actually. Uh, I did have a sticker on now. I took it off because I'm going to put a London, Ang London Predator Angler sticker on now. Um, but basically, what it is, is it's uh, just an upright. Just a piece of wood upright from the bottom. Basically, that's just so it doesn't topple over. I could probably add another one on the back. So I could have two if I wanted to. Um, it's got a piece of plated wood with a disco ball motor. I got from eBay for about £10. Um... And that's just mounted on the uh, the side of that panel, that wooden panel at the top. It's just held together with super glue and a few thin nails or, or screws. I can't quite remember. On the end of the uh, disco ball is a little tiny nodule, a little notch that turns that you would you would clip the disco ball onto. Well, what I've actually done is I bought this. Uh, well, I did have to buy it because I don't have a circular saw. I bought a really cheap MDF off of eBay for about one pound something like that thanks stupid uh it's 15 centimeters it doesn't matter about size really it's 15 centimeters by one and a half centimeters and what it is i drew holes in and then i added some crocodile clips you could use probably wooden pegs clothes pegs if you want to for, to make it cheaper but i've got these little crocodile clips 20 for about three quid two quid so i mean it all adds up and it all mounts up but you can see just how cheap you can make things and then what i did is i made a hole in the center of that and then I epoxied, five minute epoxied it onto the, the notch on the disco ball. Leave it to dry for a couple of days and then it's good to go as you can see. It's got an RPM of about two, one and a half to two. And as it turns really slowly, um, the float dries. So very, very simple. Let me, um, let me show you what I mean really briefly. Um, so you'll get a float. Just going to pop you down for a minute. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so um, I put two floats on there, two pike floats, just as an example. Um, let's plug it in and show you it working. So basically, um, you've got one that's not clear coated and one that's fully clear coated. And you can see the difference. What I do is I do half and half. So I'll clear coat the head, like I said on the, um, the foam pad. I'll clear coat the head, let it dry for about eight hours maybe longer i mean it will dry quicker but i want it to fully harden before turning it around and then what i'll do is i'll turn the float round, do the other half so the stem and then i'll turn it around and do it again and that will probably take maybe a day or two to do one coat and i like to give pike floats probably three coats and i'm talking about the epoxy now now you could use the um the aqua coat as well in the same process but the drying time will be a lot quicker and also you got to remember you've got to give a lot more coats this stuff this stuff that you use is is really thick and really strong so yeah you just need to be really careful make sure you wear masks and make sure you wear um gloves just because it's a mild this particular stuff is a mild irritant now there are different brands if you look around you can pick up uh envirotex light which i also have there's just so many brands. Make sure you get um oh need to come off. Make sure you get um a particular one that's uh make sure you get a particular one that's um uh 30 minute working time. Don't get one that's a five minute working time. As an example, this one. This five minute one is trust me, it'll dry so quick and it's not a clear coat neither. This stuff dries like a cloudy colour. This is what I use for things you don't see. So underlining things. If I don't use super glue, I'll use this stuff if I want it to be strong. Um, but if you're clear coating floats, you really need something that's clear. And give yourself a 30 minute working time. So this two tongue epoxy is really good. It's not cheap, it is expensive, but look around and I'm sure you'll pick something up. Um, get yourself some cheap brushes as I said. Mixing pots, I like to use these little shot pots as you saw me use before with the uh, with the um, sander sealer. These are really cheap. You can pick loads of these up for a couple of quid on eBay. 
uh, and that's it really like I say rather than do the whole float at once because you imagine if I clear coated the whole float that's going to stick it's so sticky it's going to stick to that um, metal and dry to the metal you know it's going to stick to that metal there and it's going to dry to it so make sure you don't trust me please don't uh, please don't um, do the whole float at once just do half at a time that's my advice so I really hope you enjoyed this series um, let's just take our float back and we'll have a last shot at it last look at it okay before I'm going to announce now so that's our finished float obviously it needs the clear coating which I'm going to do I'm not going to do that on camera there's no point I've explained to you what I do uh, and I'm sure you'll find your own way of doing things but next time you'll see me I should be on the bank next week um, making a perch video using this float specifically I wanted to do that just using worms I might head down to the Thames or over the local docks I'm not too sure yet but um, it's beautiful weather today so let's hope next week that the weather's good as well for me to go out and do it um, so yeah nothing more left to say I hope you really enjoyed this series I do apologize about the shoddy camera work on some of the uh, some of the techniques that I've shown you especially with the the threading that didn't come out actually as as well as I expected but I have left links up in the top right hand corner that you can go to and watch um, specifically the float heart Graham Pinkerton and Paul Adams is uh, handmade fisherman. They'll show you how to do whipping probably a lot better than I will. Uh, and then you'll get the general consensus and the general idea of how to whip. Um, but yes, it's once you've got your, your hand in, uh, you, you'll find it's a lot easier as you go. But like I say, I hope you enjoyed this series. I hope you enjoyed how the bobber turned out. I certainly have. I think it'll be a really nice addition to the rest of my floats. And when we get down on the old uh, Thames, hopefully, catch a few perch, it'll be all worth it. So I'm sorry that the videos have gone on really, really long, but I needed to show you guys from start to finish in depth just how, how to make them. And um, nothing left to say than thanks for watching. Like, comment and subscribe and share this video if you want to. And uh, I'll catch you all soon on the bank. Tightline and dead baits. Thanks for watching.